So welcome to Read Atlantic Voices. My name is Chris Benjamin. I'm the managing editor of Atlantic Books today. And we're very pleased today uh, to have with us Her Honor May Ann Francis. She was the 31st Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia and is also a two-time author and counting. Uh, she wrote a wonderful children's book called May, Ann, May Ann's Train Ride, uh, as well as a memoir called An Honorable Life. And she's here with us today uh, and we'll chat in conversation with Sylvia Paris Drummond of the Delmore Buddy Day Learning Institute. So with that, I will pass it on to Sylvia. Great. Thank you, Chris, again. Oh my goodness. Can I hold back my excitement? <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Dr. Mayan Francis is with us in the house, as we say, in community. Thank you so much for making the time to have this conversation. Uh, and to be able to share with us uh, your, your literary works and your story and community. I just want to acknowledge before I um, in, invite the kind of first conversation to start is, so we're doing this virtual as folks will know, but I do want to acknowledge I'm in the space in, at my office in our boardroom space where I can still feel the energy when her honor was here um, and she was sharing with us from her memoir book and that that was just such a great experience um, i just need unashamedly say how proud i am as a black woman to be able to be looking up to you and know the mentorship that you've done for community and more broadly okay so now i'm not going to keep taking up this airspace um, your Honor, I would love to invite you to just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, we know you, but in terms of community and family, kinship, um, and, and maybe if you would like how that would kind of flow into your, your author endeavors. So I will turn it to you. Hmm. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, um, Sylvia and Chris, for this invitation to be here with you today. Um, it's indeed an honor for me to be able to have this conversation, um, to talk with you about, I guess, my journey, which I always hope that um, my journey in some way will inspire people, um, especially generations to follow. I think that's very important. And also, um, my hope is that it will also be um, educational for many people as well. Um, I think that's that's part of part of the reason for my writing my memoir. Um, I know that we you've talked to me a bit about um, my background and so forth, and my memoir talks about that. But be but I'd rather just say very very quickly. And if you want me to read a part about my parents, then I will. But my mom and dad um, are immigrants. I'm, I'm the daughter of immigrants. And my parents, um, dad was from Cuba. Mom was from Antigua. And I grew up in Whitney Pier, Cape Breton, in Sydney. And that's just such an exciting thing to be able to um, talk about growing up in Whitney Pier. It's, it's, a, it's something that I just love and I'm proud of because it's, it was such a um, diverse community. Long before the words diverse and multiculturalism became something that we're talking about often, um, way, goes way back to the 90s and probably even in the 80s. But the community was a community of Polish, um, Irish, Caribbean, um, Lebanese, it was, it was all over the world, Italians, um, British, even a couple of Russians were there. It was just truly an amazing place. And I just automatically thought that was normal. This is the way life would be. And it was a community where we actually um, cared about one another. I'm not saying that we were a perfect community because um, no community is perfect. But our focus was always on the positive, and the, our parents truly emphasized education, education, caring, and respect. And that, for me, was part of my part of the foundation on which I stand. It's interesting too that the Whitney Pier was a place of many churches and uh, one synagogue, 
And my father um, met with so many clergy, so many um, religious leaders, um, police officers, politicians. So, you know, I witnessed all of this. And, it, and that also played a role in who I am today. And that to me is very exciting. And um, I'm so happy that that was the environment that I, I was raised in. Um, so that's the piece about, about my background. And if you want me to read a little excerpt from the book that talks about my, my mom and dad, I will. Would you like me to do that? Yes, please, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, chapter one obviously, and, it, and the title of chapter one is, is, is called The Beginning. And at the beginning of all my chapters, I um, use a quote from the Bible. And that just um, more or less continues to um, promote my faith and my belief um, in, in God, because I really do feel that it was, if it wasn't for my faith and strong belief in God, I'm not so sure how successful I would have been because I, I use that as another part of my foundation. So chapter one talks about, starts off with, my goodness, I disconnected the prime minister's office. They wanted to speak to you, said my executive assistant, Michael Noonan. Laughing, I said, someone is playing tricks on you. No, I'm serious, he said, sound and panicky. I have to call them back. Little did I know that phone call would change forever, not only the course of my life, but the history of Nova Scotia. Who would have thought or imagined that I, a black woman, born of immigrant parents and raised in a province with a history of negative race relations and racial segregation, would be receiving a call from the Prime Minister of Canada asking me to accept a position that would prove to be a great blessing, a very rewarding experience, even though there were times it was challenging. My parents were immigrants, as I mentioned. My father, Archpriest George Anthony Francis, and my mother, Thelma Dolores Francis, came to Sydney in 1940, the year after they were married. My father was born Jorge Antonio Francisco Francis E. e. de Verdes in Santiago de Cuba in February 16, 1908. My father, along with his sister Maria and brother Eduardo, left Cuba in 1929 for New York City. After a series of jobs, he decided to study for the ministry and became an ordained priest in the African Orthodox Church. And my mother, let's get in here and give you a little bit about her background. Um, my mother, um, Thelma Dolores, was born in Antigua, as I mentioned, on January 20th, 1907. So her birthday is coming up soon during her month. Um, she left the West Indies for New York City when she was in her late teens. Her life in Antigua was, from all accounts, a sad one. My mother was a beautiful woman. People referred to her as the quintessential lady. Mother loved music. To hear her sing, Oh Holy Night was so moving. She had a voice like her idol, Marian Anderson, a famous contralto of the 20th century, who in 1955 was the first African-American to perform with the New York Metropolitan Offer. My mother's funeral, I described her as a proud woman who walked with her head held high. Whenever she wore her chapeau, white gloves and high heels, heads turned, people smiled, and the men tipped their hats because an African queen was passing by. Oh my goodness, that is so lovely. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I hear in that such pride in family mm -hmm. and community uh, and I also hear in that influence right uh, and so thank you so much for for sharing that aspect um, of your life um, and obviously the importance of that in mm -hmm. your life. Thank I appreciate you. that yeah for yeah. sure and and it makes me uh, think about too in, in in terms of you as an author and in your in your um, connecting that uh, and um, with your community and your role. Um, and then I think using opportunities to be a mentor, to be a role model um, and through your writings to be encouraging 
to to uh, to not just uh, not just uh, folks who would read that memoir, but young children, right through your children's books. Maybe you could talk a bit to us about that about that book and what you had been hopeful for that in terms of impact influence. Well, you know, it's interesting because that was not in my plan. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that someday I'm going to be a publisher. It just never came into my head um, to have my books published, I should say. But it was, um, I was walking with one day with, um, with um, Clary Croft and his wife. And I, we were by a train station and I talked about how much I love trains. And I told him about the story about our family traveled to New York City every second summer because my father wanted to make sure we knew our aunts and, and our uncle because that's where they immigrated to from Cuba. And as I, I should also say that I have dual citizenship as a result of my parents being smart enough to say we were American children born abroad. So, mm. so my sister and I, we have dual citizenship and I voted. I just sent my ballot in a couple of weeks ago for, for, mm. for, the, for, the, for the voting coming up in November. But in any event, he said to me, because you know, Clary Croft is an author. And he said to me, that makes a great children's story. And I said, what makes a great children's story? He said, your story about your train ride. I said, I don't think so. He said, I think so. So in any event, that's, I mean, to make the story shorter, yes, that's why I wrote the book. But in terms of um, just writing, I was influenced and encouraged by George Eliot Clark, Shante Grant. They would always say, are you writing? Are you writing? Because you have a story to tell. And every time they see me, they say, your honor, are you writing? You know, then I just sort of just rolled my eyes and went back to them, you know. But um, I, I am grateful to them because I admire both of them for their writings and many other things that, that they do. And what I've learned from that is I said, well, since they were influential for me to do this, that's what I do now. I talk to people and say, you have a story to tell. I think you should be writing it. So, so far I'm dealing with three people, encouraging them, you must write your story. So, you know, especially when, when they've been, you know, as black people, they have a story to tell that's mm -hmm. a positive story. It's a journey um, and it's a, again, an educational opportunity for them. So because I was influenced, I'm now passing that on to people and talk to them and and one person who i said i'm going to harass you until you start writing and he said i will be glad to be harassed by you and i said no, no, we're not looking at it that way right so anyway that person is writing and so the other two are as well so that yeah. for me is great because i think it's important we got to get the history out there we want to have accurate history about people who have made history let's tell that story because growing up I didn't have that information and neither did you, Sylvia. So mm -hmm. now is the time. And if I can influence people to do that, I will. So the book about the train ride, um, I, I, I wanted several messages from that. Um, it, it talks about porters, like there was a porter, you know, and you know the, the role of the black porter. They were discriminated on so many levels as porters and that was the only job they could get. So, I mean, I don't go into stories about that in, in, the, in the book, but it, shows you a porter, you know, like I get all excited when I see a porter. So if you're curious, you would say, hmm, what's the story about porters? Mm -hmm. There's also, there's also the, um, the, the, the cab driver that we, we took to go to the train station. He was an entrepreneur from Whitney Pier. And way back when he had his own taxi service, so he is in my story. And then of course, the other part of the, um, what I want people to learn from, for children to learn from it is about kindness, respect, and love. Mm -hmm. So I would hope that some of those um, things that I want will come out. I'll read you just a bit from, from the book. And um, I was, that's, there it is, can you see? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's- uh, Just so I, you know. Yeah. You have it, oh. Yeah. We'll like to pop <laughs> in. We've got a little library here of, okay. of authors. Yeah. Okay, and it's it's now in French too. It's available in French, which is which is which makes me so happy. But and here's the picture of the porter I was telling you about. 
the porter talking to my sister and I as we're mm -hmm. coming to get on the train. So the porter story is a totally different story. It's, there is stories out there that Cecil, Dr. Cecil Clark has wrote mm -hmm. a story about that. And I think that is just very important to be able to, to look at that. But anyway, um, I'll start very quickly. I'll just say, Mr. Murray, our taxi drivers drove us to the train station. There's the train, I said. My heart was pounding. I was so excited. Hello, Father Francis and Mrs. Francis, said the porter. And are you young ladies ready for your train ride? He asked my sister and me. Before we could answer, he said, that's a nice purse you have there. Thank you, I said. I saved my allowance and bought it for my trip. I was happy he noticed my beautiful purse because the story does focus on my purse. The porter helped Isabel and me climb the tall train steps. All aboard, he said. Daddy explained that meant the train was ready to leave. We waved goodbye to Mr. Murray, who was standing on the platform. As the train picked up speed, it rocked us through. We were in a boat, rocked us as though we were in a boat. It was difficult to walk. Looking mm -hmm. out the window was so much fun. Isabel watched the grazing cows and tried to count the trees. Once it got dark outside, our faces in the window were all we could see. We were far away from our Cape Breton home. So I'm going to switch right over to, because we went to Montreal first, that was the train route, mm -hmm. and we stayed for a couple of hours, several hours actually, with some friends who used to live next door to us in Whitney Pier, because you had to get off, you know, it was a long journey to go to, it was like, I think then was like for three days, but I still loved it, loved being on the train. So I said, I peered out the windows, there were French signs everywhere. Montreal is the last stop. This way out, watch your step, said the porter. We spent a wonderful day in Montreal with our friends who used to live next door to us in Whitney Pier. We drove around old Montreal and sat at sidewalk cafes, saw Notre Dame Basilica and Mount Royal. After dinner, our friends drove us back to the train station. On the train, our seats were once again made into bunk beds. Before I went to sleep, I wrote about the trip so far in my small notebook. Then I put the book into my brand new purse. I was very proud of my purse. Carrying it made me feel grown up and special like mommy. She always carried one wherever she went. I fell asleep dreaming of showing off the purse to my family in Whitney Pier. Sorry, to my family in New York, I should say. Um, so I'm going to flip right over to when I lost my purse. Mm -hmm. So after a long and exhausting, wonderful day, we got back on the subway, as I skipped some stories. When the train stopped at our station, I couldn't wait to get back to the house. But just as the subway doors slid closed behind me and the train pulled away, I guess, oh no, I left my purse on the train. My beautiful purse was gone. I cried and cried. Mummy put her arms around me saying everything would be fine. I didn't believe her. I could hardly sleep that night. So there's the picture of me trying to go back to the train to get my purse. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, that's part of the story. So I'm going to leave mm -hmm. it there. You figure <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. These are little teasers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go into that and, and get the full yeah. story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I heard you mention journal. It is is that something that that is um, notebook writing? You, you might, is that something that was is a habit for you uh, in terms of um, yes, um, for a lot. You know, when I was um, named lieutenant governor, and I remember a friend of mine who grew up with me, and she was living I'm um, in the Caribbean at the time, and she said to somebody, "I'm not surprised. That's that's what she, that's what she was always doing. She was always writing in her little books about this and that." And I don't remember that, but obviously they do. So I must be. I've, I've been writing journals as an adult as well, and I mean I don't do it every day, but um, as I'm looking at downsizing things, I'm coming across journals like you've never seen. I got so many journals. And when I'm flipping through looking at the stories, and that's what helped me write my book, because I had all these stories in there and things that happen on certain days, the names of people. And, you know, so it was great because it also sparked the memory as you're writing journals. So, mm -hmm. so you know, that's what I did. I, I don't 
do it now. Um, I don't know, I don't have the time, I suppose, but, but I, I don't right now um, do journals. And sometimes I regret that I, I don't because there are things I'm saying, hmm, why didn't I write that down? You know, because I don't remember it that clearly. But journals was always a part of my life. And now it's like, do I keep these journals or do I get rid of them? So I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, mm -hmm. I wrote journals. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were, it was helpful in many respects. Yeah. Mm. There, you know, I, I, there's definitely, uh, for the folks that have had the privilege to talk to, like some themes here that uh, I just kind of wanted to raise up. And, and that is one kind of in different ways. I think in, um, in today's technology, it might be showing up in different ways as well, the forms of the journal or the note, but they're there, the, uh, the intent is still there, the essence is there. Um, and the, the, the valuing of the community uh, in the story itself, uh, is coming through and I, I hear that you know as well um, and um, I'm just very taken by everyone's humility and vulnerability in, in sharing those stories and particularly for me the comment that I want to make a connection to is um, and again I'm not encouraging you to give away all the content of the book because I it's the richness in reading but you know in your memoir and stuff how you how you how you, those stories that have been memory pieces, like as you mentioned, as well as uh, maybe more contemporary, you know, we're also used to message, right? To convey messages and to kind of address issues, uh, which I think, are, is, you know, some of that uh, is, is more evident today. It's, uh, yeah, maybe more evident is the, is the cautious phrase I'll use with that. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement um, um, that I would know from your media presence as well, that you can continue to use your, your voice uh, and your knowledge uh, to try to, to impact that to a, a positive fruition. And so, you know, you might make a comment on that in terms of your writings, um, um, yeah, in that regard, which, which also, I'll just as I go to pause from commenting, um, have showed up, you know, in op-ed pieces as well. So, but uh, in terms of your your memoir, maybe other other um, writings. Mm -hmm. um, the, when my book was published in 2019, and I mean, I started writing the book in 2017, latter part of 2016, and I I, I talked about um, the racism and discrimination here in Canada, and also here in Nova Scotia. So when George Floyd was murdered in, um, you know, in, in May, and then all of a sudden everybody started talking to it, I mean, it was moving to see people waking up finally and saying, oh my gosh, yeah, systemic discrimination and racism is alive and well. And um, that, that's so important to be able to, to know that. And I gave a talk um, a couple of years ago of Wes in, I remember saying that Black Lives Matter um, did not mean that no other life matters, mm -hmm. but everybody decided to take that and turn it against us because we were saying Black Lives Matter. We were saying that our lives matter too. Mm -hmm. And I compared it to the hashtag Me Too movement when everybody jumped on board about hashtag Me Too. But as soon as hashtag Black Lives Matter happened, everybody was like, how dare they say that? when everybody's life matters. Well, that's what Black Lives Matter was saying. We matter too. And so that now has become this, uh, has become a regular words now that you hear people say Black Lives Matter and the importance of that. And that's what's, in, that's what's really so significant when we talk about the future generations because we're gro growing up, you're always told to be, we were told to be proud of who you are walk with your head held high and know that you are just as important as other people. Mm -hmm. So when my book was published um, in 2019, as I said, I was asked by the Literary Review um, of Canada magazine to write a piece about why I wrote the book. And that was published in January. So I can read you some excerpts from that to give you some sense about what the book is about and why it's written. And um, I won't read the entire article, but I started the article by talking about um, blackface, brownface, 
And also it was during the election, just before the election, well, it was after the election that I, that I wrote, wrote the article. So I comment on some things that took place during the, um, during the election, which I thought was very um, interesting. So I'll just go very quickly where I said, and this is from the article, and it's called A Question of Time. Blackface, brownface, dual citizenship, as someone who has experienced racism, discrimination, and yes, dual citizenship, I found the 2019 federal election with its personal attacks and disrespect among party leaders stressful and disappointing. Remember the man in Montreal who leaned in and suggested that Jagmeet Singh ought to remove his turban to look like a Canadian? That exchange reminded me of a man I met at my first public function as Lieutenant Governor in 2006. With doubt in his eyes and skepticism in his voice, he said to me, we've had good Lieutenant Governors. I hope you will be too. Many observers believe that Justin Trudeau should have known better when he dressed in black and brown face as a younger man. They suggest that the Montrealers should not have told Singh, in Rome you do as the Romans do. But actions were clearly racist, but in racial discrimination, but is racial discrimination so systemic, so ingrained in our society that it is normal, almost unseen? Make no mistake, painting your face is racist and insulting. But the issue goes beyond the act of dressing up or contributing on someone's, or commenting on someone's turban. The larger issue is about the legacy of slavery and colonization, about microaggressions and unconscious bias, about overt and systemic discrimination. How many Canadians can honestly say they fully grasp all of that? These are the types of issues I raise in May and Francis and Honorable Life. I have spent more than two decades in the public eye. Being the first Black person in any field or profession is a challenge. For me, that has often meant trying to be perfect because if I was not perfect, as the first of something, there might not be a second, third, or fourth. I would not have survived without my faith in a higher power. I write about this and describe the barriers I have climbed over while on the path to success. Even as the highest ranking person in Nova Scotia, I experienced behaviors and actions that raise uncomfortable questions about race. From my first three years as vice regent, regent, for example, I had no official residence. Government House was closed for more than half of my historic appointment. Many people don't realize the levels of prejudice that exist, but are willing to listen and learn. I also know that many others are quick to deflect the issue altogether by pointing to matters south of the border. Still others maintain that racist or xenophobic innuendo has nothing at all to do with racism or xenophobia. Deny, deny, deny. Mm -hmm. I want my book to inspire people to follow their dreams, mm -hmm. to weather the storm, regardless of who they are. Uh, I wrote to encourage people to take a good look at themselves and honestly consider these pressuring issues so that we can all move forward with faith, hope, respect, peace, and love in our hearts. I recognize that there are those who won't acknowledge racism and discrimination as their problem, who believe society is fine the way it is. But is there really a difference between chance of make America great again and the urge to maintain the status quo here in Canada. I hope everyone can learn something from my journey. I also hope we can all remember that everyone has a bias or two buried in their subconscious. It is how we manage biases when they surface that matters most. That was the article.
that was published in January of this year. So much. Thank you for raising up the power of the story. Like, and, and uh, I just want to acknowledge as well that I believe it's also available in audio. Yes, it is. And it's it is, my voice. Yes. And it's my yeah. voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I really want to thank you so much for, for the readings. Uh, um, I'm, I'm overwhelmed uh, with, with the content of the story uh, uh, and the emotion that you can invoke with telling that story. Knowing for folks to hear now and understand the role of learning that can happen for them in terms of uh, taking up your memoir book and your um, children's book as well. So, and thank you again for acknowledging the role of Atlantic publishers um, and that influence and the importance of everybody encouraging everybody. There's room, there's lots of space. We want to grow that list. We want to grow that number. So, so I hope everyone that hears this message hears that very clearly as well. You've got a story in you. Let it come out. Um, so be before we, we leave this conversation, which we, I don't want to leave, <laughs> we do need to, I didn't know if there's any kind of last parting comments you wanted to have. Um, well, my, my comments are to be proud of who you are. Um, make sure education is a top, top priority in your life. Um, whether it's education at, at a university level or the community college. Um, or you're an entrepreneur, it's so important that we demonstrate what we can do. And our demonstration in terms of our availability adds to the wealth of our economy. I think it does. And I think that adds to a positive going a step forward as well. And I would encourage um, a lot of people who have done exceptionally well um, in the role as being, being the first black or being maybe not the first black person, but being involved in something. But usually if you're the first, write your story. And unfortunately in 2020, they're still the first. So I encourage people to write their story. It's very, it's very important. And I have another book coming out for children in 2021. Um, so that's another story that I hope will inspire people in some way. Um, especially children and maybe adults. I, I hear some adults say they love reading my, my man's train ride, but anyway. Mm -hmm. And so my encouragement is to be proud of who we are and continue to voice concerns whenever we have concerns because systemic discrimination is alive and well, and it's in every institution, every single instititution. Mm -hmm. And the unconscious bias, uh, microaggression, that's all out there too. So we have to keep moving forward with hope and love and respect and unity. So I think that's important. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very grateful to um, Delmore Buddy Day Institute as well as the um, Atlantic Books. So thank you. <laughs>